The great condo on Swan Street was known for hosting Saturday parties and Sunday brunches. But on the night of August 2nd, 2006, the neighbors huddled outside the home were there for a different reason. Officers of the Metropolitan Police Department and ambulance had sped into the street shortly before midnight. They watched in horror as a body was carried out of the house into an ambulance. Operator 6752, do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Immediately, an ambulance. He would be identified as 32-year-old Robert Wong and he had been stabbed to death within 76 minutes of entering the home of a friend he had known for over a decade. Was it a robbery gone wrong, an assassination, or something more sinister at play? What happened to Robert Wohn in the condo that summer night? Robert Wohn was the fourth generation Chinese American of his family. He was born in Manhattan and grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Robert was an intelligent kid. He graduated as valedictorian of his class in high school and was admitted to the College of William and Mary as a James Monroe Scholar. Robert graduated in 1996 and received an award for student excellence. He enrolled at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and graduated cum laude in 1999. Robert passed the bar and started as a law clerk, quickly rising through the ranks to associate. Robert was very active in the Chinese-American community and was president-elect of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association. In 2002, at an American Bar Association conference in Philadelphia, Robert met Catherine Ellen Yu. The two hit it off, and a year later they tied the knot. The couple lived in Fairfax County, Virginia. Robert soon left his position as an attorney and got a job as general counsel for Radio Free Asia. He worked late hours many times. August 2, 2006 was just another day. By 9.30 p.m., Robert had concluded a seminar and grabbed a quick lunch, but he still had to head back to the office and meet the radio jocks who worked the night shift. It would be pretty late to take the night train. He called his wife, Kathy, and informed her that he would pass the night at his old college buddy's place, Joseph Price. Kathy knew Price. He and his partner, Victor Zaborski, had come to their wedding. He had even hosted Robert's 30th birthday at his house on Capitol Hill two years earlier. Joseph Price and Robert had met in college in 1996. Robert had arrived as a freshman, and Price, who was three years older, had given Robert and his parents their first tour of the campus. Even with the three-year difference, the two hit it off. They had a lot in common. They were both in the honor society and held student governorship leadership positions. Price became something of a mentor to Robert. Even though they parted ways, Price went to the University of Virginia and Robert to the University of Pennsylvania, where they both earned law degrees. But the two remain close friends. Kathy wished Robert good night. It would be the last time she heard from him. The next call she would get was from Price at 11 p.m. To tell her the words she would hear would change her life forever. Robert had been stabbed and was being taken to George Washington University Hospital. Kathy immediately contacted Robert's parents who lived close by, and they made a dash for the hospital. They arrived at the hospital to learn shattering news that Robert had been pronounced dead when he arrived. Kathy was confused. How would a simple sleepover at a friend's home resulted in her husband lying dead in the morgue? Police had the same question as well. As luck would have it, they had witnesses, Joseph Price, Victor Zaborski, and Dylan Ward. The three men were able to help investigators piece together what had happened that night. At about 10.24 p.m., Price was wrapping up dinner when he received a call from Robert, telling him he was on the way over from work. A cab dropped him off less than 10 minutes later. Only Price and Ward were still up. Zaborski was already tucked into bed watching the wildly popular TV show Project Runway. Robert nursed a cup of water as the other two finished up a bottle of wine as they chatted about their day in the kitchen. Finally, Price and Ward escorted Robert to the room he would spend the night, a guest room on the second floor. Ward retired to his room, which was on the same floor as Robert. Just before he took a sleeping pill and fell asleep, he heard the shower in Robert's room go on. Bryce went upstairs to join Zaborski. At around 11 p.m., Bryce and Zaborski were awakened by a chime from their home security system. They assumed it was a tenant who lived in the basement returning. They would be wrong. 
Shortly after, they heard three low guttural screams. They rushed downstairs to check on Robert and found a distressing scene. Robert, barely conscious, with a knife lying on his chest. Zaborski screamed in shock, which awakened Ward. They called the police and an operator directed them to apply pressure on the wound with a towel. Five minutes later, the first respondents on the scene arrived and took over. When police asked them what they thought had happened to Robert, the three men speculated that an intruder had gotten into the house through an unlocked door, gotten a knife from the kitchen, and stabbed Robert. Price had done most of the talking during the questioning, but when Ward tried to speak, Price and Zaborski glared at him, and he immediately went mute. The suspicious action alarmed the police. They separated the three and took them down to the police station for further questioning. Investigators examined the house for evidence that backed the intruder angle. They found the back door unlocked just as the men had theorized, but the security gate that led to the alley was firmly shut and a seven-foot wall enclosed the property. There was also undisturbed dust and cobwebs at the point where the alleged suspect would have made his way into the property by climbing the seven-foot wall, which was the only way inside. Also, the house was filled with electronics and valuables which had gone untouched. In Robert's room, his Blackberry and cell phone were still clearly visible on the bed, as was his Movado watch. Both of his wallets were filled with cash. Robert carried two in case he was mugged. The crime scene as well raised cause for alarm, though Robert had been stabbed three times, with one knife wound even piercing his heart, there was barely any blood in the room to show the gruesome murder. The two small drops on the bed had come from moving the body. There was also no sign of a struggle or any blood drops from an individual fleeing from the horrific murder. The paramedics who had responded to the 9-11 call had also noticed some unsettling things at the scene. Robert was lying on fresh, clean sheets. The bed was so well laid that the only indentation on the bed was the pillow underneath his head. He looked like he had been showered, redressed, and placed on the bed. The stab tears on the shirt also appeared to have been freshly cut to align with the injuries. In addition, his abdomen looked like it had been wiped. Quote, kind of like when you wash a window, the paramedic had said. Why would an intruder scale the rear security fence, come in through the back door, walk past all the valuable electronic devices, pick up a knife from the kitchen, climb up the stairs, walk past Ward's room, go into the guest room, stab Robert, clean up the scene, and retrace his steps, unnoticed and unheard, in under 45 minutes. The motive in the crime raised brows. The police started exploring the probability that the suspect was right under the roof. The house was shared by Joseph Price, Victor Zaborski, Dylan Ward, and Sarah Morgan. Sarah lived in the basement and was quickly ruled out as a suspect. She was not at the house the night of the murder, and she had a solid alibi. That left their three witnesses. Investigators took a closer look at the life of the Gray home on 1509 Swan Street. Price was a talented attorney and argued cases in federal court. In his spare time, he found an advocacy group for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender Virginians called Equality Virginia. He was a gay man in a long-term committed relationship with Victor Zaborski. They each had sons with a lesbian couple. The couple hosted Saturday night parties and Sunday brunches at their home in Capitol Hill. It was through this that Price met Dylan Ward. Ward was looking for a job and had only recently moved to DC. Price helped him get a job raising funds at his advocacy group. Eventually, Ward became Price's second lover when Price and Zaborski sold their home on Capitol Hill and moved to Swan Street. Ward took up residence in a room on the second floor of the new home. When investigators searched the home, they discovered trappings for sexual bondage and torture in Ward's room. Racks, shackles, metal and leather collars, metal penis rings, penis vices, studded penis bindings, and an electrical shock device. There were also books relating to inflicting pain on others for purposes of sexual gratification. 
On Price's computer, they found pictures that suggested Ward and Price had a submissive dominant sexual relationship without Zaborski. Ward took the dominant role and Price the submissive. It was this polyamorous household Robert spent his last night. At first, investigators considered the possibility that Robert was involved in a sex game that had gone out of control or a lover's tiff had escalated. But they soon found out that Price's residence hadn't been his first choice that night. Robert had contacted a female colleague first. She told investigators that she had not been able to have him over. It was then that Robert had called Price. In addition, there was no proof that Robert was gay or bisexual. Investigators were certain that whatever had happened to him was against his will. As the investigation continued, the first officer on the scene took aside investigators and reported a discrepancy between the story Price had told him when he first questioned him and the other he later told investigators. Price said in the original admission that he had found Robert stabbed at the patio door. He and his partners had then moved him back to his room and laid him on the bed. In addition, the first respondents on the scene told officers that the three men in the house had been acting very suspiciously. They had walked into the room and found Price sitting at the edge of the bed, wearing a pair of white briefs. The other two housemates stood to the side in white terry robes. They all looked like they had had a shower recently. The paramedics also found their behaviors to be odd and very unsettling. They were not panicked. They didn't help direct them to Robert's room. One was even making a call. More and more, they started to suspect their three witnesses knew more than they were letting on. At the station, they interrogated the men into the early hours of the morning using every technique they had in their books, but the three remained stoic and clinical and stuck to their story. But when investigators asked them to explain why there was barely any blood on the scene, who had washed Robert's body, and why the bloody towels and bed sheets had been discarded, as well as who had changed the bedding, they had no explanation. They submit their DNA, air samples, and fingerprints, but with nothing tying them to the murder, the police let them go. The three men immediately lawyered up. Two days after the murder, Catherine Wohn, Robert's widow, received a sympathy call from the three men. They told her the same story they had told the police about the murder. During the conversation, she let it slip that the police would be interviewing her the next day. One of Robert's friends, Jason Torchinsky, was going to go with her to the interview. Jason later reported that the day after the interview, Price had called him to find out what the police had discussed. Jason was a mutual friend of both Jason and Price, but the call worried him. He felt the only reason Price could be asking was to coordinate what she said with his story. Either way, it did not look good for Price. Jason told his friend he couldn't talk about the case due to client attorney privilege. The remains of Robert were buried in a ceremony attended by the many lives he had touched over the years. All three men attended the funeral, with Price even serving as a pallbearer. Investigators continued working on the case. They were certain that at least one of their three suspects was involved in Robert's murder, but the only chance they had of closing the case was one of the men confessing. But two months later, a separate incident had police visit the residence once again under completely different circumstances. The house had been burglarized and almost $7,000 worth of electronics had been carted away. The culprit was soon identified. It was Joseph Price's younger brother, a student with a history of substance abuse. He had gotten into the home with a spare key and stolen the items to get money for drugs. Could he have been the one to commit the murder? The motive seemed different and there had been no theft. In addition, what would have been the reason for killing Robert? The case went cold. Two years passed. The three men bought a house in Florida, but only Ward moved there. Price and Zaborski sold the condo and moved to another apartment in DC. To all appearances, everyone had moved on from the murder of Robert Wohn. In October 2008, investigators felt they had enough to build a case against the three lovers. 
Dillon is charged with obstruction of justice, and a month later, Price and Zaborski were also charged with obstruction of justice. They presented all the evidence they had against the men. Back in 2006, they had found a set of knives in Dillon Ward's room. One knife was missing, a four and a half inch knife. This knife was consistent with what Robert Wohn would have been stabbed with. However, a knife from the kitchen that was too long to be the murder weapon had been smeared with Robert's blood and placed beside the bed to derail the investigation and lead them to search for a non-existent intruder. Further damning evidence is uncovered by cadavers and drug dogs. Ecstasy pills in Ward's room outside the house was uncoiled. The drain cover was askew, which raised questions about why it was touched. Detectives surmised that bloody clothes had been washed in the backyard stairwell and then placed in the clothes dryer to dry. During the autopsy, the examiner discovered several needle marks on Robert's body. There was one needle puncture mark at the left side of his neck, three in the center of his chest, two to the upper portion of his right foot and one on the back of his left hand. Though they had not been able to identify any drugs in his system, they were certain it had rendered Robert unconscious, which was why he had no defensive wounds or any signs of struggling. This was further reinforced by the absence of blood on Robert's hand. If he had been conscious, he would have clutched at his chest when he was stabbed, or immediately after. Robert had done neither, his mouth guard was also still in his mouth. Robert had not screamed while getting stabbed. Semen was found under Robert's genitals and in his anus. A DNA test proved that it was his. No other DNA was found on his body. Experts found this to be consistent with a sexual assault of some kind. Investigators believe that the suspect had injected Robert with something that would paralyze him and he then proceeded to assault him. When the person noticed that Robert was regaining consciousness, he smothered Robert and stabbed him to death. There had been no intruder. They hoped that by arresting Ward, they would get a confession that implicated his former lovers, but Ward stuck to his story. The majority of Roberts and Price's mutual friends believed an intruder was breaking in and committing the murder. They had no idea that Price was a suspect in the murder. Faced with the hard evidence, they found themselves wondering if Price was hiding a murder or the murderer. Robert's widow, who had maintained a cordial relationship with Price, filed a $20 million wrongful death lawsuit against the three men. On June 2010, the judge made her ruling. She agreed that while the intruder's explanation was unlikely and that all three men know something about who killed Robert Wohn, based on the evidence available, no single one of them could be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. All three were found not guilty of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and tampering with evidence. Joseph Price changed his name to Joseph Anderson. He is currently an attorney at a communications and consulting firm and a member of the Florida Bar Association. Dylan Wade also changed his name to Dylan Thomas. He briefly worked as a fitness trainer for a gym in Seattle before returning to Florida to work as a Pilates instructor. Victor Zaborski neither changed his name nor his job. Katie Wohn's wrongful death claim against the men was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount and an agreement. Till today, nobody knows what happened on the second floor of 1509 Swan Street.